Okay, so thank you all so much for um, sticking around in track two of the Games User Research Virtual Summer Camp. Uh, next up, we have a talk look at, with a detailed look at users' experience through interactive visualization of their data. It's going to be given by um, Erica Kleinman and Maggie Sig uh, El Nasser. So they're going to be taking questions at the end. Please, as you have questions throughout, please post them in the Q&A. And we have a moderator, Triscala De Haven, who's going to be here to collect those and help answer questions when we get to the end. Uh, at uh, just before 12 o'clock. So take it away whenever you're ready. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Erica. I'm a PhD student in the GUI lab at Northeastern University working with Dr. Maggie Saif Elnasser. And today we're going to talk to you a little bit about using interactive visualization to study uh, user strategic behaviors in games such as esports. So just a brief overview, um, I'll start by introducing the topic and the motivation behind this work, and I'll then introduce you to Stratmapper and Glyph, which are interactive visualization systems that we've developed in our lab to facilitate context-aware data analysis. Um, and I will then demonstrate how these can be used to extract meaningful strategic insights, both independently and together, and I'll go over a case study we did where we used data from the esports game Dota 2 and then I'll wrap up with a conclusion and some discussion of future work. Uh, so diving right in. So as I'm sure everyone already knows, good game design relies extremely heavily on a comprehensive understanding of the user experience. And for many games, UX research is conducted during development to ensure that players are understanding and experiencing their game in the intended manner and to check for any unintended experiences that the game could be causing. But at the same time, there are also a number of games, such as most popular esports or massive multiplayer online titles, that regularly update and adjust their designs as they release new content to players. And for these games, UX research is an ongoing process that is used to understand how players are playing the game to better inform what kind of changes they can or should make to the game. Uh, in addition, there are also many researchers who are studying the user experience for academic or scientific purposes to better understand the effects games are having on people's lives. But just a high level understanding of how players feel while playing a game is never enough. And regardless of whether UX research is being conducted during development or continuously over the lifespan of the game or in an academic context, it is of critical importance that developers and researchers are able to obtain comprehensive granular knowledge about what players are doing in game as many questions about how players are experiencing a game can be answered by looking specifically at what they're doing as they pursue their goals. Which brings us to this first question, which is how can you understand the user experience at such a granular level? And there really is no one right answer, but a popular approach is to use data. And in pursuit of granular detailed knowledge of players in game behavior, many have turned to data collection and analysis, either as a supplement to or a replacement for more qualitative research methods. And this is especially true for massive multiplayer online games, especially esports, where they constantly need to study the experiences of incredibly large player bases. And there are a number of benefits to using data to study the user experience. It can be collected in the wild, as in it can be collected in the background from players playing the game on their own time in their own environments, which means it may represent more authentic behavior than what could be done in a lab setting. At the same time, data can also be collected in a controlled setting, which makes it very versatile to the needs of the researchers. It can also be collected very easily, even from massive numbers of players, meaning that can easily scale to the kinds of player bases that regularly play online games. Uh, and even if the games are smaller or they may only undergo research once, large amounts of data could still be collected to ensure a comprehensive understanding of the players. It can also be analyzed very quickly and efficiently through statistical methods, which can help with quick iterations during development. However, there are some downsides to using data. Uh, games are extremely contextual environments and players' actions are inevitably going to be informed by that context. However, a lot of purely quantitative data-driven techniques aren't really able to preserve much of the context and this can lead to misconceptions about why players are performing certain actions and how those actions are relating to the user experience. Similarly, game data is incredibly complicated, not only due to scale or context, but because players will pursue, adjust, abandon, and resume gameplay goals on the fly. And many data-driven techniques struggle with that complexity, and ultimately they have to simplify the data to analyze it properly. And finally, many statistical techniques deal with aggregated data, and this can cause individual differences between players, which are inevitable in such open environments as those available in games to be overlooked. And ultimately, these concerns regarding data analytics are incredibly, 
are incredibly important to game user research because if you fail to understand the context that informed a player's actions or overlook an unpopular strategy because it didn't show up much in aggregated data, you can end up making design decisions or adjustments that confuse or frustrate players at best or completely break the game at worst. And then the question is, what do you do? How can you extract complicated context-aware behavioral information from data? And that's a very good question, and there really isn't one best way to do it at this point. But previous work has shown that visualization is a promising avenue to explore. It can preserve the context surrounding the data and can also facilitate human analysis, which can allow for the examination of more complicated data and potentially preserve individual differences. Many visualization techniques also make it easier for non-experts to examine the data, meaning that it can be shown to various members of a game development team or even to the players and playtesters themselves to get their explanations and insights into the data. And the benefits of visualization can be enhanced through interactivity. Uh, and this brings us to the work we've been doing in the GUI lab. We've developed a methodology for data analysis that we call Interactive Behavior Ana Analytics, or IBA, which leverages two interactive visualization systems to allow for human-in-the-loop analysis of complex gameplay data. And in this talk, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the entire methodology. Uh, I will instead be focusing on the interactive visualization tools that we've developed that allow us to extract meaningful and actionable insights from the game data. Uh, so I'm now going to talk a little bit about StratMapper and Glyph, which are two tools for interactive data visualization that we've developed. And I'll talk a little bit about how they can be used to get this detailed uh, data as part of game user research. So the first one I'm going to talk about is StratMapper, which is an interactive visualization tool that allows for the spatiotemporal analysis of game data. So on the upper half of the screen, there's a map, and below it is a timeline. And both of these can be zoomed and repositioned by the user. Each icon represents an event that occurred in the data, and each color corresponds to a specific player. If you hover over an icon, you will see a tooltip with detailed information about the event. An icon's position on the timeline represents when it occurred during gameplay, and its position on the map represents where it occurred. And by adjusting the size and position of the selected area on the timeline, you can filter what data is shown on the map. And the data you're seeing here is from the game Dota 2, uh, which is specifically an online multiplayer esports title. But StratMapper is relatively generalizable, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So one of StratMapper's most notable features is its labeling system. So if an analyst finds a period of interest, they can select it on the timeline, mute the unrelated players and events, and they can apply a label. So applied labels appear in the bar at the top of the timeline, and they're visible to all users of the tool, which provides users with the ability to discuss the data as a community. And as a part of the IBA methodology, we did develop a formal approach to labeling, which involved domain expert input, iteration, and integrated reliability measures. Uh, but StratMapper and its labeling system can be used more casually just to annotate points of interest in data or communicate between users. So to give an example of how StratMapper and its labels can be used to analyze highly contextual events in the data, I'm going to show you a demo using data from Dota 2, where we label two events in which heroes are on the Radiant team are killed by heroes on the Dire team. And what you'll see in the video is that although the location, and death, the location of death for both heroes was really similar, the circumstances that led to their deaths are pretty different. So in the first event, um, a hero named Alchemist is killed, and you can see that this event involves five heroes. Um, so Alchemist moved to the bottom lane where he was able to farm for a little bit before he was ultimately ganked by three members of the enemy team who come in from the jungle area, um, and they end up killing him. And one of his teammates does show up towards the very end. He teleports in to try and help him, but he's too late to do anything about it. And you can see this extra circle here that showed up at the end. The second event involves the death of a hero named Silencer, uh, and there are three heroes involved in this one. So Silencer was traveling around in the bottom jungle area when two members of the enemy team came after him. Uh, he runs to the bottom lane, probably trying to get shelter under his allied towers, but his, pursu his pursuers are able to chase after him and get the kill. So although Silencer and Alchemist both died in the bottom lane and actually died very close to where each other was, the circumstances surrounding their deaths are actually pretty different. One was ganked while he was farming and the other one was fleeing the jungle for safety and got pursued. And if you look closer, you can start to unpack why these events happened and why they might have differed. So before his death, Alchemist, 
has a lot of kills on enemy and neutral NPCs, and you can see those here on the timeline. Um, and these are called creeps. And what you do throughout a game of Dota 2 is you kill these for gold and experience, which is called farming. Um, so Alchemist is a type of offensive hero called a carry, and carries start off very weak and have to focus on farming to gain power so that they can scale into powerful late game killers. And one of the best ways to slow down a carry's progress to, towards that goal is to kill them early game because they'll lose time to farm and they'll have to catch back up. So going after Alchemist early game, which is when this occurred, is actually a very good idea. But specifically, why did they do it here? Well, if you look at Alchemist's positioning prior to his death, compared to the rest of the team, you'll notice he's actually all alone. So Alchemist is here and his closest teammates are up here. So carries don't have a notably high defense, which isn't an issue in the late game because they usually can kill their opponent before dying, but it can be a problem early game. So here, because Alchemist is all alone, he's pretty much defenseless, and that makes him a pretty easy target in this exact moment. So this was a very good strategic opportunity for a gank. And as you, can, as you saw in the video, Alchemist's teammate did actually try to come and help him. He was just too late to do anything about it. So if you look at Silencer's gameplay leading up to his death, it's pretty different. He actually doesn't have a lot of actions on the timeline at all. Um, and he seemed to mostly be moving around the map without regularly attacking anything. And what we found is that this kind of gameplay pattern is actually more indicative of a hero being played in a support role. And Silencer is a hero who can be played as a support. Uh, and they're generally not as important to kill early game as offensive heroes like Carries and Alchemist, but if you look at his positioning leading up to his death, you'll notice that, like Alchemist, he's actually mostly alone. So he's here, and he traveled here from this area, and he has some teammates who are over here, but they're still not that close to him. So he was specifically alone in the jungle, so it's likely that he was performing a reconnaissance role. Maybe he was checking to see what camps were up or trying to establish vision on the enemy, was spotted by the enemy, and was ultimately taken out because, well, A, they had him outnumbered, which made him an easy target, and B, there's really no reason not to try and get a kill if you're able to. It's also noteworthy that Silencer's teammates didn't try to come and help him like they did for Alchemist, which may be because losing a support early game is less detrimental than losing a carry. So there's less payoff from trying to help, which is a really risky move in and of itself because a would-be rescuer could also end up getting killed. So this is just one example, and it's looking at a relatively simple set of events, but you can look at much more complicated events like a five-on-five -five team fight or dig a lot deeper into the details, but this demonstrates how Strap Mapper can help an analyst dig into contextual factors surrounding player behavior and even make connections between behavior and the game's design. And what you can see from this example is that even simple events that may look similar on the surface are actually pretty different when you get into the details of the context, such as how many attackers there were, where they came from, and what role the victim was filling. And in the realm of user research, being able to tease out these really detailed different types of scenarios um, that may lead to different events, such as the death of a hero in the bottom lane, can help better inform design decisions. So for example, if you were a Dota designer who didn't want heroes to die in the bottom lane as much, maybe you could use this information to inform changes to the map's design. Maybe you can move towers or erect a different defensive feature. Or maybe you want to make it easier for teammates to quickly get to each other so people don't like, die defenseless so often. Or maybe you don't like that the support hero's teammates didn't actively try to rescue him and you'll adjust the game to make it more incentivizing to do so. And because the labels are visible to all users, researchers can work together to build on each other's knowledge and discover new and insightful elements of the user experience. Labels can also be derived casually as a way for analysts to annotate the data and communicate or more formally, such as how they were derived with the IBA methodology for a more formal research study. The second tool I'm going to talk about is Glyph, and Glyph has three graphs, the state graph, which you can see over here, the sequence graph, which you can see here, and a group graph, which is in the bottom left corner. The state graph consists of game states, which are represented as nodes, and then player actions, which are represented as links between the nodes. In the sequence graph, each node represents a full sequence of state actions for the players, and the size of nodes in the sequence graph represents how many players had that particular tra uh, trajectory through the state actions. You can select the node in the sequence graph and see the corresponding state action in the state graph and the complete sequence below in text. Similarly, upon selecting a node in the group graph, you can see a full sequence of team behaviors for all members of the team in the sequence and state graphs. And it should be noted that the uh, distance between the nodes in the sequence graph represents how similar the state sequences are. So here's a short video where you can see what I was just describing. 
Um, so you can see if you select a node in the sequence graph, the corresponding nodes and links are highlighted on the right. And you can also see the full sequence and text at the bottom. And similarly, when you select a sequence in the group graph, all of the associated trajectories are highlighted. If I can get to the next slide. To give an example of how Glyph can be used for analysis, I'm gonna show you this demonstration where we used it to analyze players' dialogue choices in an RPG style Fallout mod. Uh, so this is an older version of the Glyph interface. Uh, the functionality is the same. The primary difference is there's no group graph since this was taken from single player gameplay and the state graph is now on the left and the sequence graph is on the right. So each node in the state graph represents a line of dialogue that an NPC could say to a player during one specific NPC interaction in which a townsman is trying to give the player a quest. So basically the player had some questions they could ask the NPC and he would respond. And each of those possible responses is a state. And like before, each sequence node on the sequence graph represents a single trajectory through the states. But you'll see here that some of them are larger and some are smaller. So the larger nodes belong to trajectories that were more popular that had more players take them and the smaller nodes are less popular ones. And in this particular situation, the red nodes belong to um, players who did not complete the quest that was given by this NPC, and the green nodes belong to players who did. So looking at Glyph's state graph, you can see that the blue sequence, which is sequence zero, is very large, which means it was a very popular trajectory, whereas this orange sequence, which is sequence five, is very small, indicating that it's not a terribly popular one. And we can also see that they're not very close to each other, meaning that they're pretty different. Um, state graph, you can see that the popular zero, which is the blue one, represents a very direct path through the dialogue with the NPC. And if you look here, you can see it almost follows a straight line. And what's happening is that the player is only asking the NPC questions specifically related to the topic at hand and the quest that he's about to give. So this trajectory is very to the point, and it probably represents a player who just wanted to progress through their objectives as quickly as possible. The orange sequence, which if you remember is the less popular sequence five, is more indirect. It twists in and out of the main line quite a bit before eventually converging with it at the end. And what's happening is that the player is asking more questions about the game world, and therefore the NPC is answering with information about why the sheriff isn't helping, what the biker gang is doing, where the train station is. But eventually they also accept the quest, which is why they do converge with sequence zero towards the end. So both sequences go all the way here, uh, but the orange one is overlapping with the blue one. So from this, what you can learn is that the most popular gameplay strategy in this case, which was represented by sequence zero, is to take a very direct path through the dialogue and pick up the quest as quickly as possible, while taking the more exploratory route through the dialogue and trying to learn more about the world is actually much less popular as a strategy. And this kind of information could be very valuable to developers who are trying to figure out where to dedicate resources. If they know that the most common user experience doesn't involve extensive exploration of additional dialogue options, then, oops, um, of additional dialogue options, then they don't have to focus on that too much during development. But at the same time, knowing that it is a strategy that exists, even if it's in the minority, allows them to make the informed decision of including it as an option in some form, specifically to please that portion of the player base. Now, both tools can be used individually to study user experience as you've just seen, but they can also be used together. And to demonstrate this, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of a case study we did in the past where we used both tools in tandem as a part of the IBA methodology that I mentioned previously to extract strategic insights from the game Dota 2. Uh, so in this particular study, we followed a more formal approach in which labels were derived by two researchers who were both domain experts with extensive Dota 2 knowledge and experience. Uh, the experts referenced forums, tutorials, streams, and match videos, and developed an initial list of 24 behavioral labels, which was simplified to a list of nine labels for the purposes of the case study, and these were those nine labels. So following the formal guidelines of the IBA method, the two researchers separately applied the labels to, the two, to two games that were extracted from professional gameplay. And through two iterations of this process, they achieved an iterator reliability of 0.72, uh, which indicated strong agreement on the labels. And you can see it here in the screenshot where they were applied. And then the exported label data was sent to Glyph, and this is the resulting visualization in Glyph, which you may recognize as the one you saw earlier. So in this case, unlike the uh, dialogue example, each node in the sequence graph on the left represents only a single player because no two players have the same trajectory, which is why none are bigger than any other. So here specifically, I've highlighted the players who belong to each team in each game. So the Dire teams are on the right and the Radiant teams are on the left and the game one teams are on top and the game two teams are on the bottom. So one of the first things you can see here is that the sequences for game one are pretty different from each other as represented by the distances between them. 
Well, the sequences for game two are pretty similar, and this is because the games progressed very differently. Game one was really one-sided. The Dire team gained a very early lead, and the Radiant team never really caught up, and this resulted in notably different gameplay behaviors. And these differences are highlighted when we analyze some of the individual sequences. So, for example, these highlights come from two heroes who were in the same roles on opposing teams in that first game. The differences in their glyph visualizations reflect notable differences in how their individual behaviors were labeled in StratMapper. So the Radiant hero was never labeled as being part of a push, and he also never transitioned from a gank to a kill. I know there is a line here, but I assure you it's going in the other direction. Uh, and these indicate more defensive or disadvantaged gameplay, given that if you've fallen behind, you probably will not take risks, such as pushing into enemy territory or risking your own life by trying to guarantee a kill. By contrast, the dire hero has numerous transitions to the push state, and he successfully transitions from gank to a kill. And this indicates a more offensive gameplay pattern in which this hero was probably constantly applying pressure to his opponents. In game two, you might notice that the sequences are much closer together, indicating that all the players across both teams played much more similarly. And this is because, unlike the first game, this was a very back and forth match where both teams experienced winning and losing states and therefore had to play both offensively and defensively. And again, this is well emphasized by looking at the sequences of the applied labels. Here, these two heroes who filled the same role on opposite teams visit almost the exact same set of labels with just the order and frequency varying. One final thing to note from this example is that these eight heroes across games one and two had really similar sequences. Further analysis of the StratMapper data revealed that these heroes were played in supporting roles and what we determined from this is that supporting heroes tend to play similarly to each other, regardless of the power balance within their respective matches. So wrapping up, what this case study demonstrates is how using these two interactive visualization systems to extract granular information about player behavior allowed us to derive meaningful conclusions about how players were experiencing the game in terms of how their actions, behaviors, and strategies were influenced by the gameplay context. Specifically, we were able to see how the power balance within a particular match, as well as the roles filled by the specific players, would influence the kinds of strategies that they were or were not willing to engage in. And this kind of information can be really valuable to game developers who are trying to design a very specific intended experience, because ultimately, it's impossible to control exactly what players will do, but if you have this kind of insight on how the dynamic nature of the game environment impacts a player's behavior, then you can make design decisions that restrict or expand that environment in accordance with your intended design experience. So wrapping up, it is critically important for researchers across all types of games to be able to understand the player experience at a granular level. Players' actions are heavily informed by the contextual nature of the game environment, are incredibly complicated, and can vary drastically from one another, and the, user, and the best informed design decisions are ones that are able to understand the intricacies of these actions and apply that understanding towards an intended experience. While data is a promising avenue for gaining such granular insights, many traditional methods don't handle the data's complex nature very well. And this can lead to misinformed design decisions that can frustrate or confuse players or even break the game. We've demonstrated how interactive visualization systems can aid in this process by preserving context and individual differences that may be lost by more traditional data-driven techniques and by facilitating human interpretation. Such systems can be used in place of or in tandem with more qualitative research methods and playtesting to supplement the insights gained from those techniques with low-level granular information about player actions. Since the, visualization, since the visualizations allow for easy data analysis by non-experts, they can even allow playtesters to provide insight on their own data or involve more members of the development team in the user research process. Regarding the generalizability of these tools, as you saw, Glyph has been used to analyze data from both a multiplayer online game as well as a single player RPG game. Similarly, Glyph has been used to visualize very large data sets and rather small ones. In addition to Dota 2, which you saw earlier in the presentation, StratMapper has also been used to analyze data from several other multiplayer games, including Boomtown, which is pictured here, which is a mining game that's developed by Gallup where players work together to obtain gold. And we are currently working on implementing a StratMapper instantiation with data from a single player game. So we argue that this approach and these tools or tools like these can be used um, and can be used and applied to multiple types of games and it's not limited to only one type of game or genre. So going forward, in addition to exploring single player game data and StratMapper, we're also exploring ways to update the StratMapper interface to represent behaviors in the form of a more hierarchical abstraction tree 
where low level actions are connected to higher level behaviors and goals. We believe that such a representation could further the tool's ability to provide researchers with granular insights about the player experiences as it is reflected through their behaviors. At the same time, we are looking into opportunities to perform usability studies on StratMapper to see how it can be fine-tuned to better serve different communities, including user researchers, game developers, esports coaches, and spectators and players. And that's all I have for the presentation. Um, I just want to thank everybody who worked on the StratMapper project and the Glyph project, who are all pictured here. And yeah, I can take questions now. Uh, do we have time for questions, Becky? Uh, I mean, this is the end of the session, but it is lunch. Um, at this time, it's a lunch break, so I think people should feel free to go. But if people want to stay around for a couple questions, that's up to, to what everybody wants. OK, great. So I will tell you the two questions you have, Erica. Uh, so the first one is, this is very cool. Uh, how do you share insights across researchers and designers, such as an insight library? Um, so I think currently, we don't really have like a formal insight library. So if you're using StratMapper and you see something you want to share with the rest of your team or with other people, you can label it in StratMapper and other people will be able to see it. As far as like using the tool, coming up with some insights and then sharing them with the rest of the team, at the moment it's mostly done manually where you have to contact your team members yourself. But we are looking into expanding the tools in the future to better facilitate people's needs. Great. And then another question you've had was from Susan or Suzanne, which says, have you used these tools for mobile uh, gameplay analysts? And if not, how do you think this could generalize to that type of game research? So I, we have not used StratMapper for mobile game work. Um, I think Glyph was used to analyze a puzzle game before I joined the project. Um, I don't know if it was a mobile game or not. I think Maggie can weigh in more on that. Um, as far as generalizability goes. You want me to weigh in now? Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we also use this for an art game, so which has a mobile compo component. As long as we can get the data from that and, and put it through to Glyph, we can, we can do mobile. Um, if you have movement data in the uh, in the mobile side of things that can be translated into data that we could see in uh, Strat Mapper, that's also possible. But we haven't done that um, because we weren't tracking actually movements in space. Yeah, and as far as generalizability in general goes, um, as long as the game can be abstracted into states, which arguably almost any game could be, uh, both tools to an extent could work. Um, StratMapper is somewhat restricted to games that have a physical space component, but Glyph, as long as you can split it into states and actions between those, you can definitely apply it. Cool, and that's so far all the questions we have. If anybody wants to ask any more, you're more than welcome to use the question and answer feature or you can post them in chat. Otherwise, uh, leave it to you, Becky. Oh, yeah, I think that's all we have. Thank you again. Thank you so much to our presenters for this drive, for our moderator. Um, we're now on to a lunch break, so hopefully people will uh, take some time, take a break, get something to eat, and we will be back here in this stream at one o'clock for our next talk, Development and Validation of a Heuristic Checklist for Virtual Reality Game Design. So have a good time, everybody, and we'll see you in an hour.